Good morning and welcome wherever you are to our morning worship from Stamford Methodist Circuit. A special welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. My name is Chris Pursehouse and I'm a local preacher and a member of Deeping's Methodist Church in the Stamford Circuit. As we begin our act of worship this morning, I'm going to light a candle to remind ourselves of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ with us as we worship together. Lord our God, you create and you sustain. You are with us in the rhythm of work and rest in the pattern of praise and silence, in the balance of silent prayer and spoken word, and in the spontaneity of friendship and love. You are with us all our days. Make us aware of your presence now as we crown life with worship. In the name of Jesus, whose renewing life we celebrate this day. And so we continue our worship as we sing number 409, Let us build a house where love may dwell. Let us build a house where love can dwell And all can safely live A place where saints and children tell Our hearts learn to forgive Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace. Here the love of Christ shall end divisions. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place.
that hymn reminds us that all are welcome. And so we come before God with our prayer of praise and adoration. And when I say the words, God is good, will you respond, we praise him. God is good, we praise him. Let us pray. To be surrounded by a world of beauty and wonder, to be awakened from refreshing sleep, to witness the glory of the seasons, to feel the warmth of the sun and the cooling breeze and the dampness of the rain, is to appreciate and know the love of Creator, our Father God. God is good, we praise him. To be surrounded by the affection and trust of friends, to feel the supporting love of the fellowship of the church, to hear a reassuring word and to see an encouraging smile, is to know God's Son, Jesus, among us, with his healing touch and renewing grace. God is good. We praise him. To be surrounded by the atmosphere of worship, to feel a sense of purpose and faith, to come with longing to know God more clearly, to love him more dearly, and to follow him more nearly, is to know the Holy Spirit alive in our midst. He is here. His power is in us all. God is good. We praise him. To be surrounded by the majesty, the humanity and the daily strength of Father, Son and Holy Spirit is to know ourselves richly blessed, deeply forgiven and strongly inspired and wonderfully loved each new morning. And for this daily miracle, we are moved to say over and over again, yes, God is good. We praise him. Amen. There are many uh, around the circuit that are involved in education. You may be teachers, youth workers, etc. And this morning I wanted to interview one of our members at the Deepings Methodist Church, Rachel Hamby, a teacher in a local primary school. And so this interview was conducted early on in the week with Rachel to find out how life has been like as a teacher and how it relates to her particular faith how her faith has encouraged and helped her. And then we're going to hear from a little girl, Hannah, who's gone back to her local school in recent weeks. What was it like for Hannah to go back to school? So we're going to hear two interviews now. Please listen to them. Rachel, it's good of you to join us um, today. Um, you're a primary school teacher in a local primary school. You're a mother-to-be. How has your Christian faith helped you during this period of your, your teaching career, your life? I find that the community of church really comforting. And actually, I've missed that social interaction with my Christian peers throughout lockdown. Um, I found the online services really um, important for me on a Sunday to kind of have that routine. I know that church is more than just attending the building itself and seeing the people, but actually it's really, really helped to just keep that, um, that feeling that you know you're all together taking part in that service all at the same time, even though you physically can't be with each other. Um, and throughout this stressful time of lockdown, because it has been rather stressful at times trying to get all of these things in place, um, we've had a really strong um, group on Facebook Messenger where we've been chatting together and actually lots of prayer requests have been going on there and, and I put a few on myself for those times where I was feeling particularly stressed, just asking for um, the church community to just think of not only myself as a teacher, 
but teachers right across the country who were going through similar stressful things. Yeah. So yeah, it's been really comforting. Good. And um, uh, as well as a teacher, um, you're a singer of 40 songs and um, many of those songs uh, that you sing supported and encouraged people during the war. And of course, during the last 10 days, we've heard of the, the passing of Dame Vera Lynn. Um, when you sing those songs again, um, what will be some of the emotions that you might feel yourself uh, when you look at those lyrics in the light of what you've experienced during lockdown? Do you think it will change you? And what do you think? Well, it's interesting you say that because actually a lot of the songs that I've sung, I've done a few online performances um, during lockdown mm. and um, at different moments over the, the months, the weeks, certain songs have really struck a chord and actually made me quite emotional and it's not that when you read the lyrics it's not that they uh, particularly are saying what we're going through now it's just the feeling you can tell the feeling behind them is so provocative of what they had during the war years and what we are currently experiencing and um i think yeah when i i'm actually going to be doing a bit of a public gig at the weekend which i'm really looking forward to because i haven't done any live singing uh, for a long time and um, I am I'm looking forward to singing those those particularly those songs by Vera Lynn again. I think there will be a lot of um, emotional responses uh, when uh, people hear them sung live again. Definitely. And, and what will it mean for you when we're allowed to meet again for public worship? How will you feel that that first time when we're back in the building and you are up the front with the worship band and singing live? Yeah. Well. Yeah, that's definitely a moment that I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, I know there's a lot of talk at the moment about not being allowed to sing when we finally do meet again in, in church buildings. And that is a strange feeling for me because singing and um, praising in that way is, is a big part of the worship for me. I get so much from that. And um, I can't wait to do it again, particularly with the other members of the, uh, the music group. Um, but also just in a congregational sing, I think it just, it's so uplifting. And I think um, hopefully when we do return, we will be able to join in that, that singing and we won't be told that, you know, we just have to sit back and listen because um, it, it just won't be the same. Yeah. Well, Rachel, I'd like to just thank you for all that you do in the church with your gift of music and singing. And I just want to just have a, a short prayer with you now before we, we hear from Hannah. Lord God, we give thanks for Rachel. We give thanks for her talent of music and singing and uplifting singing. We pray for her as she continues her work in a local school. We pray that you will guide her and guard her and help her to encourage and support the learning of her students. And we think of all those who teach across the circuit. We pray and ask your blessing upon them. Amen. What was it like going back to school after lockdown? Um, going back to school after lockdown was scary but exciting because I was happy to go back to the, back to my school. What did you most look forward to about going back? My friends, being, being able to see them and doing the work that I missed out on. And what did the teacher do to you to make you feel welcome and safe? Um, what they did was we what was every single um day they would ask they would ask us if we were having a good time at school. And how was the setting of the school? Is everything a little bit different now? Um, no, not different. The only thing that's changed is. There are dots and lines on the floor that um, keep our social distancing to people. And you're happy to be back? Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Hannah. One of the things that we've missed during lockdown is seeing some of our children and young people at things like Messy Church and the Friday Club. I chose this next song as it reminds us of the joy which we've had on those occasions. Our next song is called Wide and Long and High and Deep. And the song has got some actions and you might like to do them alongside the actual singing of the song. 
wide, long, high, deep. Let's join as we sing this song together. Friends, I've chosen as a um, psalm this morning, Psalm 139, verses 1 to 18. And our psalm is going to be read for us by Georgie Kane, a member of Deeping's Methodist Church. Psalm 139. Lord, you have examined me and you know me. You know everything I do. From far away you understand all my thoughts. You see me, whether I am working or resting. You know all my actions. Even before I speak, you already know what I will say. You are all round me on every side. You protect me with your power. Your knowledge of me is too deep. It is beyond my understanding. Where could I go to escape from you? Where could I get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you would be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you would be there. If I flew way beyond the, to the east, or lived in the farthest place in the west, you would be there to lead me. You would be there to help me. I could ask the darkness to hide me, or the light round me to turn into night. But even in darkness, it is not dark for you. And the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You created every part of me, you put me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because you are to be feared. All you do is strange and wonderful. I know it with all my heart. When my bones were being formed, carefully put together in my mother's womb, when I was growing there in secret, you knew that I was there. You saw me before I was born. The days allotted to me had all been recorded in your book before any of them ever began. Oh God, how difficult I find your thoughts, how many of them there are. If I counted them, there would be more than the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Let us come before God with our prayer of confession. Let us pray. 
Merciful God, we confess to you all in our lives that grieves you. Forgive us for fearing to trust you. Forgive us for fleeing to gods of our own making, as if to find there the support only you can provide. Forgive us for wounding with words instead of healing with hands. Forgive us for being quick to anger and devoid of steadfast love. Forgive us for being slow to care and abounding in indifference. Forgive us for forgetting to affirm and being too ready to condemn. Forgive us for treating as duty what should be delight, as burden what should be privilege, and as intrusion what should be loving sacrifice. Forgive us for insisting in our own fallenness and failing to see your grace at work in our lives. Forgive us for being too concerned with sin and too little aware of forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer, and in your mercy, forgive. Amen. We sing together the hymn, There's a Wideness in God's Mercy. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel and this reading is given to us by Karen Kendall, a member of Deeping's Methodist Church. Reading from verse 40. He who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives the one who sent me. Anyone who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward and anyone who receives a righteous man because he is a righteous man will receive a righteous man's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones because he is my disciple, I tell you the truth, he will certainly not lose his reward. Before I preach, let's just have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we give thanks for Holy Scripture, inspired by your Holy Spirit. We pray that that Spirit may work in our hearts and our minds as we think about how your Word relates to our lives and our church communities. We ask this in your name. Amen. Some of you will be aware that I am a child of the manse. My father was a Methodist minister and one of the memories I have of 
how busy the manse was on a Sunday. My father would sometimes be taking three or four services on a Sunday. And of course, uh, my mother would be very busy preparing Sunday lunch. Now, my father had a habit of inviting people back to the manse, sometimes for Sunday lunch, sometimes for tea. And if mum was lucky, dad would say something about it to her. But more often than not, dad would come home with someone who would share a meal with us. And the same was on Christmas Day. As a family, we often had and invited uh, members of the church who may have been on their own, neighbours perhaps who had celebrated Christmas on their own. They joined us around the table for Christmas lunch. And I have many happy memories of um, some of those times we spent as a family, as people stayed with us, got to know us, and shared our hospitality together. And as I reflect on that, I'm very much aware that strangers joining us often became guests, and those guests often became lifelong friends. The importance of welcome and hospitality given to others should never ever be underestimated. It is an important ministry in the life of the Christian Church. And our short brief reading from Matthew's Gospel is a powerful reminder of how important hospitality is. And I would like to share some thoughts on this very brief passage. The reading from Matthew comes in a section where a lot of the emphasis is on the sending out of the twelve disciples on mission. Jesus' instructions to them are very clear, to take very little with them, that the work will be difficult, that sometimes they will be persecuted and rejected. Matthew early on in chapter 10 says they will be like sheep among wolves. And Jesus shares that it won't be easy and the likelihood is that those um, disciples would face persecution and rejection. However, in chapter 10 verses 40 to 43, the instructions that are given are not to the disciples but to those in communities that the disciples will be going to. And the instructions are to welcome and to offer hospitality. Indeed, the word welcome is mentioned five times in three verses. And the instruction about hospitality is shared when it said, give a cup of water to those who come amongst you. The welcome you receive can often make all the difference. I once attended a church on the Fens near Ely and we had a wonderful steward who was very good at being a steward and very good on his timekeeping. And every Sunday evening he would wait at the door of the church waiting to greet the visiting minister when they arrived. And he would become very anxious as it moved slowly round to six o'clock. And this particular Sunday, a minister was visiting from another church in another circuit. And it was about ten to six, I believe. And the minister had not yet arrived. But the steward noticed that someone driving a, a high-powered uh, motorbike had pulled into the church car park. And the steward went over to the man and challenged the man right away, pointing out that it was a private car park for church members and that he shouldn't be parking there. At which the man got of his motorbike, unzipped his leather jacket and took out of his side panniers a clerical cassock, a dog collar and a Bible and asked of the steward if he'd be shown to the vestry so they could get ready to take the service. So often 
we make our decisions about who we will welcome from the outward appearance that we see. And like that embarrassed steward, sadly, we can do the same and make mistakes. I wonder how good we are as a church community in welcoming people who cross the doorway of the church, who come along as a new person to a service or one of our midweek group meetings. Sometimes those of you like myself who have been members of the church uh, for a number of years can forget what it feels like to walk into a church for the first time on their own. It can be a daunting experience and some of what we do in worship and how we do it may seem very alien to someone who has never set foot in a church. Friends, to really welcome someone takes time and effort. And I would like to suggest it is much more than simply introducing ourselves and saying the word of welcome at the door or smiling at them. I want to draw your attention to our opening hymn. It had a chorus, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. But friends, if you look at the verses of that hymn, the emphasis of each verse is on building. Building a community of people where people can fulfil their dreams and their visions. Where people can be empowered to speak and to witness. A community that will welcome the outcast and the stranger. Welcoming does involve building a safe space where people can come just as they are, where people are not afraid to share how they really feel, if their life has fallen apart or if they're hurting after a broken relationship. And if they do share something like that, that there will be a safe space for them to be listened to with grace and understanding. And the last verse of that hymn talks of a community built of tears and cries of laughter. Friends, the church must be a welcoming space where people can come into it just as they are and just as they feel. Sometimes we're not very good about being open and truthful to each other. I know that sometimes in the past, when people have asked me how I feel, I've sometimes just said, yeah, fine, when sometimes I've been hurting inside. About 20 years ago, I suffered from quite a bad bout of depression. And I know that I wasn't particularly honest with some of my church friends at that particular time. I was embarrassed about talking about my fragile mental health. And sometimes we're not very good about being open and real with each other. During the last three months of lockdown, I've been trying to keep in contact with some of our members by phone. And in some of those phone conversations, some of you have shared how openly some of you are facing some of the challenges and frustrations. Unable to meet your friends and families. Unable to go to some of the groups that you belong to in the community. Unable to join with others and sing hymns in Christian worship. And sometimes some of you have gone on to say, oh, I apologise for sharing all this information with you that I'm not really feeling very good at all as if I don't want to hear it. It's very important that we create those welcoming spaces and those relationships where we can be real with each other. As the lockdown is slowly being lifted, we will one day be allowed back into our church buildings for public worship. I would like to suggest that welcoming people back to the church and the groups that use our buildings will be a really, really important part of our Christian ministry. 
Some members of the community may have been shielding, others self-isolating. And it is natural that to begin with, people may feel reluctant and perhaps fearful of being with large groups of people or being close to each other. It also may be the case through our online church presence that some may want to visit one of our churches in the Stamford circuit for the first time, out of interest. The warmth of welcome they receive will be very important. The welcome is an important part of Christian ministry. But the passage of scripture that was read to us also says something about the importance of hospitality. The passage reminds us of the need to show hospitality to those that visit us. Matthew reminds his readers that the importance of offering a drink of water. Now, in a hot climate like the Middle East, you can see the need for refreshment being offered immediately to anyone who calls it a house. Perhaps in our culture, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee is our welcoming drink, our icebreaker if you like. Friends, I wonder if I asked you what you most missed during lockdown, what your answer would be. I guess some of you might say you miss not having your hair cut. I have not. What I have missed most during the last three months is not being able to share any meals with my family and friends. Every meal I have had has been on my own during the last three months. And I long for the time when I can share a meal with members of my family, people invite people round for a meal in my own home, to go to some of my favourite pubs and restaurants for a meal with other people. Friends, offering and receiving hospitality, being with people you love and care about, sharing the same physical space is very life enhancing. I will never ever take that for granted again. It's no wonder that in the Gospels they record for us the Lord Jesus having meals with his disciples and with some of his closest friends. We hear how he regularly went to the house of Mary, Martha and Lazarus at Bethany. We hear in John's Gospel that he joins a community wedding at Cana and saves the host's embarrassment when the wine is running out. In his encounter with Zacchaeus, Jesus invites himself to Zacchaeus' house. In a lot of these situations, Jesus is the invited guest, one who appears prepared to accept the hospitality of strangers, outcasts and sinners. Someone who is not afraid or embarrassed about the company he has around him at the meal table. When we offer hospitality to others, we are offering a place at our meal table, sharing food and refreshment. Most of all, we're sharing the gift of our time with other people. And when we offer hospitality, strangers become guests. Guests become friends and friends can become fellow disciples of Jesus Christ. In December, I was in Stamford on a Saturday and I found myself uh, in Stamford doing some shopping and at about 12 o'clock I made my way to Barnhill Methodist Church and there I attended Second Helpings for the first time. As I walked into the hall I was immediately greeted uh, by a man who was very welcoming with a welcoming smile and a kind invitation and said to me you can sit wherever you like at any table there's no special places just sit where you want to 
and he explained to me the procedure of what would happen and what food would be available and when it would be announced. And so I sat at a table on my own, but not for very long. I was quickly joined by one or two other people who I didn't know and have never met before. One of them, I think his name he said was John, said to me, I don't think you've been here before. Is this your first time? He immediately engaged me in conversation. Other people joined me and I had a wonderful experience at Second Helpings on that Saturday. And as I looked around me and saw some of the conversations, some of the people present, I was touched by the warmth of the welcome and the hospitality. At the end of that particular Saturday, as I reflected on that particular day in Stamford, I reflected on the fact, where had I met Jesus Christ on that Saturday? And I couldn't help but reflect on the positive experience I had at that particular um, second helpings at Stanford, the warmth of the welcome and the hospitality. At the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, Luke shares a picture of the early church, which is deeply attractive and also challenging to us. Luke writes in chapter 2, verse 44, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as had a need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. We have this wonderful picture of the early church being a welcoming, hospitable place where people can come and join and be part of something. The importance of welcome. The importance of hospitality. But I'd also like to draw your attention to the reward. In my Bible, um, which I have, the passages uh, on the, uh, at the top of it says reward. In that passage from Matthew, Jesus' words are that if we welcome the stranger, you're in fact welcoming Jesus. And if you welcome Jesus, you welcome the one who sent Jesus, God. If you offer a cup of water to a stranger, we are offering it to Jesus. The reward that Matthew talks about is that we will know that we are doing kingdom work. Mother Teresa of Calcutta says a similar thing in one of her books. Whenever you feed the poor and the hungry, whenever you welcome the stranger with a smile, you welcome Christ. Friends, the reward as disciples of Jesus Christ is that when we welcome and offer hospitality, we welcome and offer hospitality to Jesus Christ. As I said to you a little bit earlier on in my sermon, we are approaching the end of lockdown. And as we re-engage and will one day be allowed to attend public worship, the, one of the most important things we will have to rediscover is the importance of welcome, and the importance of hospitality. And I long for those occasions when we can share a church meal together, when we can share in Holy Communion, when we can have those conversations around a table. But the most important part of all is that we understand and practice the ministry of welcome and hospitality. Amen. It's with great pleasure that I'm now going to introduce the Reverend Ruth Charlesworth, who's going to lead us in some prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Holy and loving God, in the beginning you created the world, 
and breathed your life into it. We think of those bringing new life into the world, giving thanks for families welcoming new members of all ages, and we pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Sharing food with friends and strangers, you showed God's presence in the ordinary, everyday act of living. We remember all those ordinary people who have allowed us to meet God alive within them. We give thanks for those who have inspired us, those who have cared for us when things were rough. We pray for those who seek to inspire and care for those who are struggling and those who are sick. We pray that you would enable us all to offer something of you in ordinary acts of kindness and hospitality. We remember your family encompasses all and we pray for respect for one another and that you would enable us to create a world where all are valued regardless of creed, gender, age or ability and love because you loved us first. Make your church a people of welcome where all may find solace and where all may celebrate, all are valued, all are loved and all find refreshment. We bring our prayers to you as we share in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'd like to say a big thank you to all those who contributed to our service of worship this morning, and also those who helped in its preparation. I do hope that you've enjoyed worshipping with us this morning. And I hope you'll be able to join us again in the future. We conclude our service of worship this morning as we sing number 545, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart.
So as we conclude our service this morning, a blessing. As you continue on your way, may you know that God goes before you by the strength of his Spirit. Share your faith with the uncertain, share your love with the unlovely, and share your presence with the lonely, and share God with everyone, just as God has shared himself with you in the unfading blessing of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Manna rain down from heaven. This isn't second guessing. We know that we are protected. May the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message. Grace and favors in your nature, in your essence. Please favor be upon you and a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and the children, and the children. Please favor be upon you. Yeah.